the Union Canal, brief history of. The canal was begun in 1818, completed in 1822. It ran for 31 and a half miles between Edinburgh and Falkirk, where it joined the Forth and Clyde Canal to form a through route between Edinburgh and Glasgow. It was closed to navigation in 1965 and reopened in 2000, with about a mile added to reach the Falkirk wheel, which was the new junction with the Forth and Clyde. These are the bare facts, and um, in fact, if you want a very brief presentation of the history of the canal, that's it. Because all the rest and everything else I have to say is, is just elaboration of what you see on that slide. Anyway, I'm going to elaborate, and I shall deal successively with the origins, then the construction, use, disuse, and finally reuse of the canal. Not quite finally, because when I've done all that, we will then do a literally zoom along the canal, a virtual trip as the canal is today. We'll start then with origins. Why was it built? Well, the Union Canal was built primarily to bring cheaper coal to Edinburgh, but it was also there to carry goods in general and to convey passengers. The initial thoughts were to connect to the Lanarkshire coal fields because via the Monkland Canal, which opened in 1793, Glasgow was being supplied with relatively low-cost coal, and Edinburgh wasn't. At the same time, there was a desire to link Leith to the Clyde, to counter the rise of Grangemouth, which was thought to be on the up following the construction of the Forth and Clyde Canal, which opened in 1790. So they wanted a canal to link Edinburgh and Glasgow. The route, seven lines in all, were considered. Four lines from Leith to the Broomy Law were proposed by the engineers John Ainsley and Robert Whitworth. They all had some merit, but the sharp rise from Leith and the undulating ground in West Lothian made them all difficult. John Rennie, the celebrated engineer, uh, was invited to adjudicate, and he did uh, plump for one, but he also suggested a fifth line of his own, which was running through Linlithgow and Falkirk and joining the Monkland Canal at Drumpelia. Then the Napoleonic Wars intervened, and until 1813, nothing very much happened. And at that point, when people returned to the idea of a, an Edinburgh-Glasgow canal, two new lines were proposed. Hugh Baird, who was an engineer with the Forth and Clyde Canal, proposed a level line from Fountain Bridge in Edinburgh to Falkirk, and then a lock flight to join the Forth and Clyde. And Robert Stevenson of the, the Lighthouse family, he suggested a level line from Princess Street to the Forth and Clyde summit at Castle Cary, which would have meant no locks. And incidentally, he would have used Princess Street Gardens, as they now are, then it was the Noir Loch, that would have been the canal terminus. Interesting that neither of these two later lines uh, accommodated Leith, which did give rise to uh, some grumbling, but not a lot, because in fact, Grangemouth had not proved as big a threat to Leith as had originally been feared. Nor did either line connect to the Lanarkshire coal fields, because it was now established that there was a lot of coal readily available from Stirlingshire. Of these two later lines, I mean, Stevenson's had the decided attraction of no locks, but it would have involved a three-mile tunnel at Winchborough. This was judged altogether too big a risk, and Baird's line, which got a strong endorsement, incidentally, from Thomas Telford, perhaps the most celebrated civil engineer of the time, that was the line chosen, and it's the line that we have. I move on now to, con sorry, that's going the wrong way, construction. Well, the legislation was passed, finance was raised, construction began in 1818 with Baird, appointed as the engineer in charge of the canal. And incidentally, on his appointment, he doubled his Forth and Clyde salary from 250 to 500 pounds a year, which uh, in those days was a pretty big sum. And five years later, the canal opened in May 
Four years later, the canal opened in May 1822. This was entirely in line with Baird's projection and represented a considerable achievement. Everything was done by hand, 31 and a half miles of canal with cuttings and embankments, 62 bridges, uh, in, interestingly, I say all fixed. They were fixed because unlike the Forth and Clyde, this wasn't a ship canal. There was no need to deal with vessels with masts. And um, Baird played fairly safe with the bridges. There are no skew bridges. Every, he made sure by twisting the canal if necessary that uh, when it was to cross anything, the crossing was at right angles, uh, which um, my niece, who is a civil engineer, tells me skew bridges are a lot more difficult to build than ordinary bridges. So much for bridges. There were three aqueducts for the three river crossings, the Leith, the Ammon and the Avon. One tunnel, 11 locks and other sundry buildings, warehouses, houses for staff, stables for horses. He to arrange a water supply, which came from Cobbenshaw in the Pentlands, and also a the means of dealing with getting rid of water when it was too plentiful, having a number of overflows at regular intervals. And as I say, the canal opened in May 1822. And the next slide is just a, a picture of people digging a canal, but it's almost certainly not the Union Canal. Um, most of these features that I mentioned in the, the canal are, most of them are still there, but not all of them. And the ones that are not there, um, you will see now. And that's the beginning of the canal, which was at Port Popton in Edinburgh. That was the, the warehouse building that marked the, the terminal basin. That was a painting by Sam Moth, an artist. It actually, the canal doesn't mention in the title, it's called Edinburgh Castle. But, I mean, it is a picture of the entrance, broadly speaking, to Port Hopeton. And the other end, which is no longer there, that was the old flight of 11 locks that connected the Union and the Forth and Clyde canals. And that was the terminal basin at the Falkirk end. This was it, if you can see what I'm pointing to. And that is the Forth and Clyde canal, as you see a ship canal, the tall masted ship. So much for the construction of the canal. As I say, it was constructed well within the timetable projected, but unfortunately Baird's financial projections were not as robust. He estimated to earn roughly 285,000 to build the canal, and the outturn exceeded that by almost three quarters at 462,000. Why did this happen? There were several reasons. The main ones were, as I've listed on the slide, compensation to affected proprietors. People complained. For example, Captain Maitland Clifton Hall got 3,000 guineas because the canal was passing quite close to his property and he would be disturbed by all these navvies. And they probably would be because they were a fairly unruly bunch. Um, again, Baird underestimated the cost of acquiring land. He had thought he would get land for 122 pounds an acre, but, and this is an extreme example, he had to pay 450 pounds an acre to the trade's maiden hospital in Edinburgh, which was not a hospital, it was a girls' school in Edinburgh. And again, compensation or land acquisition, 12,000 guineas was spent acquiring the Glen Fuhr estate, which had not been in the budget. Again, there were changes to the route, principally, uh, they had to reroute the canal through calendar policies in Falkirk because Forbes of Calendar reckoned that it was going to be too close to his house and uh, required the canal to be diverted and a tunnel board, the Falkirk tunnel, which we have today. That, of course, cost a lot of money. And, of course, there were the usual uh, unforeseen minor difficulties that occur as for example, with the aqueducts and with the feeder that attend practically all capital projects at some stage. That is an artist's impression that Forbes had made to, to 
it probably exaggerates uh, the interference he would have had, but this is Calendar House, as you can see, and that was what he said it would be like if the canal was not diverted. Well, a number of these um, uh, overruns might have been foreseeable, but um, some were, some were not. But the upshot was that the company had to raise almost 172,000 more than had originally been planned. The original financing was 240,000 500 pounds in shares plus 50,000 in borrowing. And they needed, as I say, another 172,000. That was a shortfall they met by borrowing, always in anticipation that better times would be just around the corner. That never happened. And they never really recovered from that. In 1826, they got parliamentary approval to convert the outstanding, all of the outstanding debt into equity. And the intention was that the then shareholders, I mean, some might have been original shareholders, others might have been those who had bought subsequently, but that the 1826 shareholders would subscribe to that equity. But in fact, a, a third of them never paid up. So as I say, 75,000 plus of debt remained and the canal company never really got on top of that. And as we see in 1849, by the time the merger with the railway took place, they had a net deficit of 95,000, which the railway met as part of the deal. That, however, is to anticipate. Um, at the moment, uh, we have um, uh, a canal which is in use, and we will go on to look at how it was used. But just before that, I thought I might put insert here a word about Hugh Baird, a shadowy figure, as you can see. Um, Baird was the engineer for the canal, but I mean, you will not find him listed amongst the, the great civil engineers of the, the 19th century, probably because the Union Canal was the only project that he ever superintended. But Baird was obviously highly competent and well regarded, as the commendation of his route from Thomas Telford illustrates. He was also versatile, so as well as surveying and being in charge of the building of the canal, he designed houses and boats for the canal company. And um, I'm indebted to Mike Smith for this. He was also the man who advised the demolition of the crown on St. Michael's Church in Linlithgow. Uh, rightly or wrongly, but uh, so he, he, he did quite a lot of things. But as one has to say that his time with the Union Canal Company was not entirely happy. From early on, from within about a year of the, the project being underway, there were complaints that he spent too much time at his home in Kilsyth and left too much of the work to juniors. From time to time, there were moves within the company to reduce his salary and appoint a deputy. Uh, incidentally, a post for which rather cheekily Baird nominated his son. Uh, but that, neither of these things happened. Uh, his salary wasn't reduced and a deputy wasn't appointed. In fact, the, the reading between the lines, the truth, I think, was that throughout this time, Baird's health was progressively in decline. And in fact, those moves reflected tension within the company between those who felt they weren't getting value for the fairly high salary they were paying Baird and those who were realized that he was sick and were reluctant to be too hard on him. In any event, shortly after the canal was completed in 1823, he was relieved of his post and retained as a consultant. Although, as far as I can gather from the records, he doesn't seem to have been consulted about very much. He died in October 1827, and his death is simply noted in the company minutes without any comment or tribute. So much for Hugh Baird. We can now go on to the, look at the canal in use. It had 20 years of active life. Coal, as expected, was the mainstay. And for example, our records show that for example, in the week, first week of November 1839, at least 84 barges passed through Linlithgow, carrying some 3,000 tonnes of coal. 
which, you know, well, that was November, perhaps demand was high then, but that probably represents something between 120 to 130,000 tonnes a year which was about a lot of coal and was meant it was quite a valuable, lucrative trade. So much so that in 1823, a year after the canal opened, a new basin, Port Hamilton, was created in Edinburgh specifically for the coal trade and uh, named Port Hamilton because the Duke of Hamilton was the owner of most of the supplying pits. Coal was a major cargo, but of course only part of what was carried. There were also luggage boats, as they were called, which carried mixed goods. We have records of some of those, and they typically they were carrying things like cereal, beer, and kippers, uh, called red herrings in those days. And unusual, more unusual things as well, quite a few records of carrying hoops, which I imagine was for glue making. And there's even some references to carrying gunpowder. And also, again, a, a word which was, was new to me, they, they carried sparagles, which I, I found out were um, studs for putting into boots to give, give them a, like packets to give them a better grip. So much for goods. There was also a flourishing passenger trade. Uh, some of this was on luggage boats for those who weren't in a hurry or didn't want a high degree of luxury, but they were mainly on dedicated passenger vessels built for comfort and speed. Edinburgh to Glasgow was achieved eventually in seven hours, passengers changing boats at Falkirk to avoid the descent of 11 locks. These boats that did that trip were travelling at an average of nine miles an hour and they had right of way. They were pulled always by two horses, which were changed about every eight miles and controlled by a riding boy who was a young lad who sat on the, the second behind most of the, the, the two horses and he was equipped with a horn and a whip to make sure they, they, they got on with the job. And I imagine that was, that was probably a job which was in quite some demand. Uh, as well as these uh, passenger boats running by the day, there was also a sleeper service that did, of course, go down the locks. Um, but they, they said that they offered um, luxurious, fairly luxurious accommodation, commodious beds, they said. And they stressed that they had heated cabins and they offered meals. And you got, I mean, for example, you know, breakfast was provided with two eggs for one and tuppence. These boats were popularly uh, known as hulets, some say because of the, the sound made by the horn, which the, 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 the driver of the, the horses had, or I suppose it might simply have been because they traveled at night when they were uh, on the nature of owls, I don't know. But that was, uh, in summary, the, the use made of the canal, and all this traffic was very tightly regulated. Boat manifests detailed what was being carried, and the requisite payment for different goods uh, set out in quite elaborate tables of charges. Boats had to display their number and owner's name, and it was specified that had to be done in letters six inches high on a black ground. No movement was allowed on Sundays, and heavy freight barges could not operate between 11 p.m. and 5 a.m. On the passenger boats, there were bans on smoking, swearing and drunkenness. The fenders were put ashore at the next staging post. The emphasis clearly was on quality and indeed it was priced accordingly. Typical fares, they varied a bit over time, typically it was six shillings for a cabin, four shillings for steerage. And I reckon that made the cabin fare, that was the one way cabin fare, uh, Edinburgh to Glasgow, the equivalent of about three days wages for a navvy. Overall, in its heyday, this would be, well, there's, there's a couple of pictures here just showing that's a typical freight barge um, carrying you know, heavy stuff. And there they shows luggage boats, also with two horses, incidentally, uh, on the top and the fast boats at the bottom with the, uh, the horses um, going up the gallop, the canter at least. And as I say, overall in its heyday, this would be a busy canal with something like 300 vessels passing Linlithgow 
every week, probably on average about one every 20 minutes during daylight hours. Um, pretty busy. So what we want to disuse now, what went wrong with all this? The basic answer is underlying financial weakness combined with the arrival of the railway. The canal, as you see, it, it made a surplus. Staff were paid and modest dividends were on occasion declared. But their figures, carrying figures, were not outstanding. As you see, they carry a lot less than the Forth and Clyde and a lot fewer passengers, for example, on the Paisley Canal. And the revenue, I mean, Baird had estimated that they, it would uh, bring in 50,000 a year. In practice, it was never more than 17. As I said before, their debt service was always a problem. Dividends, uh, their shareholders weren't all that happy. Um, dividends weren't very good, less than other canals and infrequent. And then when the railway came along, they were simply not competitive. They resisted the railway quite reasonably because um, I think they recognized that it would probably outdo them. And they resisted it successfully over a time, but it did come. They tried to compete, prices were slashed. For example, the rates in 1845 were only half of those in 1837. And right into the 1840s, they were still try commissioning new boats to try and make the canal attractive, but they didn't succeed. In 1845, a grand merger of the Union Canal, Forth and Clyde Canal, and the railway was proposed, but that didn't materialize. In 1848, the Union Canal discontinued passenger services, and in 1849, it independently agreed a takeover with the Edinburgh and Glasgow Railway. The railway absorbed the canal debt and distributed railway shares to the canal shareholders. In all, the railway paid 209,000, generally thought to have been an overpayment because had they done nothing, the canal would presumably have simply withered and died. But of course, that is a judgment with hindsight. What is certain is that the decline was steady particularly after the takeover with the railway. And this slide illustrates that. 1842, the railway opened, 1849 as said they bought the canal. In the next 40 years, tonnage and uh, revenues went down by roughly the same, by about a fifth. And then from 1890 to 1920, next 30 years, tonnage went down by a further Four fifths. Now, decline by a fifth over 40 years was perhaps tolerable, but decline by four fifths over the next 30 was uh, not sustainable. In 1922, Port Hopton, the Edinburgh end, was drained. In 1933, the Falkirk end was filled in, pictures of those we have seen. And in 1965, uh, because of pressure to get rid of, mainly to get rid of humpback bridges to improve roads, the canal was closed to navigation. And thereafter, infilling for roads and housing took place quite regularly along the canal. And it was really only the use of the canal for drainage and for supplying cooling water to bankside industry that countered the media and popular pressure for total infill and kept the canal going. That, uh, yeah, that's a slide showing Port Hopeton drained. That is uh, what happened to Port Hopeton. Quite a bit of time after it was drained, that was the uh, 1930s, the Lillian House, and that's what it became like uh, before uh, the, the restoration. And that is the head of the old locks, which were closed 1933. As I say, after that <coughs> closure, you got a number of covertings and further closures to assist road building and housing. And this is a, a list of them. We'll see later on what they happened to them later when it was restored, but that was blockage at Kingsnow. 
because the potential blockage about a mile uh, west of Hales, where the canal was culverted. M8 blockage, Green Dykes Road at Broxburn, Preston Road at Linlithgow, Valor Road at Muravenside. That actually wasn't a blockage because that, that was uh, never blocked. That was just a, it was a very low uh, tunnel which canoes could get through, but certainly not um, anything like a passenger boat. A801 blockage. And so by, the, by that time, the canal was really in 1965 and thereafter, uh, was at quite a, a, a low point. How, how, we now move on to reuse. So how did this come about? Reuse for canals is, in fact, uh, synonymous with the, the rise and use of canals for leisure use. There had always been some leisure use on the canals. Uh, that's, uh, I know, short of rowing boats at um, uh, Lochran in Edinburgh. I don't know when it was quite dated, 1930, something like that. And there were certainly, I can remember that, canoes um, at Falkirk, the Tascan. And they had those there, I mean, in the years just, just after, after the war. But basically, the canal was not about leisure, and leisure was not officially encouraged. It was you know, part of the transport, the working transport network, along with railways and roads, and laterally came to be regarded as a quite outdated and expendable part of that transport network. Serious leisure use can, I think, be traced probably to publication of Tom Rolt's book, Narrowboat, in 1944, and the founding two years later by him and Robert Aikman of, in England, the Inland Waterways Association. Scotland uh, was a bit slower off the mark, but soon caught up. And these are the landmarks of the uh, regeneration and reuse of the Union Canal. 1971, Scottish Inland Waterways Association was founded. And much due to pressure by them, in 1972, um, a proposed five mile closure of the Union Canal was rejected. Now that closure was proposed by Stirling County Council to assist um, road building and uh, other uh, improved amenity projects. And the five miles would have run from the lower bridge to the, broadly speaking, the eastern end of the Falkirk Tunnel, that is to the, the boundary between what was the county and the borough of Falkirk. Um, <clears throat> Siwa um, strongly under Basil Skinner, one of, one of the, the founders, and resisted that strongly. It went to public inquiry, and the reporter, David Anderson QC, I suspect to the surprise of a number of people, recommended against the Stirling County Council proposal, and uh, this was upheld. That rejection was upheld by the, sec the then Secretary of State, Gordon Campbell. That was quite a, a major decision because had that happened, um, I don't, we, we could not have got the Millennium Link because the proposal was to fill in and close five miles. It wasn't to culvert it or allow it to reopen. It was to be firmly closed. Anyway, that was a major step. The rest we've got 1974, Ronnie Rusak launched Pride of the Union. 1975, Lux was founded, and thereafter, a number of other canal societies. 1978, Seagull Trust came along. And another um, major uh, step, 1987, the aqueduct across the Edinburgh Ring Road was opened. The original intention had been to make the crossing at grade and to terminate the canal and obviously, I mean, Wester Hales was, was already there by this time, and the idea was to terminate the, the canal at the western end of the Wester Hales closure. And there were thoughts of creating a, a proper terminus there. But this, this was, proposal was rejected, and the, eventually Lothian Region, as it then was, agreed to take the canal across the Ring Road by means of an aqueduct. 
1979, the canal was designated an ancient monument. I mean, that didn't restore anything, but it was a safeguard against uh, further closures. And then a, a minor triumph for Lux was in 1992, when Preston Road blockage was removed, and that was reopened. But the real breakthrough came with the Millennium Link, which, of course, uh, with money from the Millennium Fund, allowed the Union and the Fourth and Clyde Canal both to be totally unblocked and reconnected by the Falkirk Wheel. Um, so the canal was again in use and the, what remained to be done and which was done quite quickly was the blockages were cleared and the two canals were linked and opened, the Falkirk Wheel was opened by the Queen in 1982. Uh, before that, we have, uh, that was the opening of the M8 blockage, and that, as you see, Ronnie Rusak and Mel Gray, uh, Lux's founder, meeting in the middle. That was the, how busy Broxburn was uh, on the opening day. And that was the opening of the Falkirk Wheel with um, one of our late Stalwarts Colin Galloway standing there by Victoria. So that was the canal opened. That was now 20 years ago. Since then, the canal has seen a fairly healthy growth of leisure traffic and some residential traffic. And with the odd setback notwithstanding, um, such as the closure we have just now, uh, it looks as if that will continue. And that is all a great tribute to those who over the years fought hard to get the canal opened when certainly officialdom, the official view was firmly against any future, any significant future for the canal. At best, it would have been a sort of disconnected pieces of water uh, suitable for, you know, canoeing, rowing, or and uh, very sort of short local trips like that. So people like Basil Skinner, Stanley Ross Smith, Mel Gray, uh, these were amongst the figures who did so much to get the thing opened. Uh, they are all dead, but the other, uh, one of the other figures, Ronnie Rusak, of course, is still very much with us and still campaigning resolutely uh, against any threat to uh, the canal. As I say, that was 20 years ago, and we hope that the canal will now proceed uh, and be, continue to be successful. And we can now take a trip along the canal, more or less, as it is today. That's Edinburgh Quay today, more or less. That's what happens when you look west and you look to, along towards the Lymington Lift Bridge. After that, you come to the Viewforth Bridge, which is the first bridge. Curiously, not numbered. It's not numbered. Num it's the next one that's numbered number one. But that's, uh, th that is the first bridge. And it is an interesting bridge because it contains on one side, the east side, the arms of the city of Edinburgh. And then on the west side, on the, above the keystone, the arms of the city of Glasgow. We move on to Harrison Park. Um, uh, stopping place for, for visitors and at the just at the end before that bridge we have the what was the headquarters of the Edinburgh Canal Society now disused rather sadly but the building is still there and of course the Edinburgh Society played a, a, a major part in the reuse of the canal and the reopening of it. Slateford Aqueduct um, I said we would see these features in this trip. That is the first of the, the three main aqueducts and that is a picture of the overflow, not uh, overflowing very much in, in that picture, but all, well, the, the, that and the Amund aqueduct of overflows, the Avon aqueduct doesn't have one. What they all have, including Slateford and the other two, are inspection chambers and that's the entrance to the inspection chamber on the Slateford Aqueduct. Removal of blockages, uh, that's King's Now today, and that's a rather poor photograph, so that's, that's it from the other side. That's Wester Hales, rewatered. That's also Wester Hales, the 
plethora of new bridges. And then we come to the, that's the Scott Russell Aqueduct, that's the aqueduct across the Edinburgh Ring Road. And that's the view of the Ring Road that you get from the aqueduct. And that bridge which commemorates John Scott Russell, after whom the aqueduct was named, who discovered the solitary wave. I won't go into what that is. It's, uh, um, there are people in the audience who know more about that than I do. Uh, but that's in Bridge 11. Then we've gone to Rathal, Bridge Inn, of course, um, owned, developed as a canal centre by Ronnie Rusak over the years that he was in charge of it. Now we have a small marina at Rathal in uh, association with a, a new housing scheme. Moving on, you come to the Amund Aqueduct and the feeder. And this is the, uh, this is the canal coming and turning into the aqueduct, that's the feeder joining it from there. If we go back to the feeder, that comes from Common Shaw in the Pentlands and comes down via uh, natural and, and man-made uh, channels. Uh, that, that's it in the Amundel Country Park and that's where it's already been taken off the, the, the river by then. And that is the picture that you saw a few slides previously with the feeder going into the canal, which is coming down there. That's the Almond Aqueduct. That's its overflow, doing rather better than the slate for aqueduct in that picture. And that was 1895 when the overflow froze. That's Pride of the Union, one of Ronnie's boats crossing the Almond Aqueduct. Then again, uh, opening up of blockages, that's the M8. Uh, Broxburn, um, you saw a very crowded Broxburn at the opening of the M8 blockage, that's more like what it usually is. Green Dykes Road, that's now unblocked. That is Winchborough, um, that's the headquarters of the Bridge 1940 Society, one of our current fellow canal societies, which grew out of the, the, the former Buchan Canal Society was one of those founded early on. Craigton Bridge, that is um, of interest because it has uh, above the keystone, uh, not the number, but the arms of, of the Hopton family and the initials of, I think, the Earl and um, Countess of, of, of the day. Uh, one other thing which you can probably just discern, but which I find interesting about the bridges. In these, on the towpath side, where of course there would be a, a, a rope stretching from a boat, all the edges are rounded. They're not rounded on, on the other side, it's just a, a small feature of these uh, bridges. And it's true, as far as I'm aware, of all the bridges on the canal. That's the other side of the Craigton Bridge. Since that faces west, it's rather more badly weathered than the east side. Um, coming nearer to home, at Narrowboat Farm, uh, a, a recent development, Bankside. So again, reasonably recent at Park Farm Bistro. And then we come to Linlithgow, where you see not only the rounded edge, but also the grooves that the ropes made where um, the boat had to make a turn. And that's the basin. Um, probably from Mans Road Bridge, taken quite high up. Um, at this point, although it's probably unnecessary for this audience, uh, the, the talk contains um, just a sort of quick resume of Lux and what it does, and we'll go through that. Our boats, um, well, you won't see that today, that's U66, um, the first boat, which um, I think it did all sorts of things, but I mean, there were others, like, again, uh, who can uh, speak to that uh, more knowledgeably than I can. But of our present boats, Victoria, which you all know, St Magdalen, Leamington, well, not ours, strictly it's Scottish Canal's boat, but we operate it, and the new boat, St Michael. We have our museum, opened a long time ago, there it was, opened by Tam DL, whom you can see at the, the door, and I think holding the microphone is Mel, Mel Gray. And now we have also the tea room, uh, usually quite busy. Yes. And we have fun days, cardboard boat race is quite a feature. Boats afloat and boats sunk. And at Christmas, we have Santa. 
we move on. Um, and just along there, um, just before Bri the Friars Bray Bridge, we have one of the milestones. Well, milestones put every half mile along the canal. Um, it was about a third remained at restoration. The others were all, well, they said they all replaced. Most of them have been, and they, they, they're now all, or most of them are readily visible. Uh, but that's an example of the, the type of milestone, which was um, made with the distance from Falkirk on one side and from Edinburgh on the other. But again, blockages removed with Preston Road, Preston Road from the west side. That is an example of an ancillary building that was uh, that's Woodcock Dale, now the Sea Scouts, but formerly stables for horses and I think um, accommodation. There were probably four uh, sort of one or two roomed houses, both downstairs and upstairs, at each end. And above, in between, <coughs> it was loft for fodder and uh, things that horses need. The Avon Aqueduct, um, the longest of the three, and second longest and highest, or third highest, I think, the second longest in Britain. And that is a staging post because the canal was divided into four stages for charging purposes. And there was a stage roughly every eight miles and there were posts and that is the one which marks the beginning of the final stage, um, which runs from the aqueduct from your own side up to Falkirk. That's an aerial view of, of the Avon Aqueduct. Moving on, another new canal side development, Bridge 49, uh, which is just about there. And that's Causeway End, which was the uh, uh, transshipment basin, because the Bathgate, Red Glasgow Bathgate Railway came in there, and you could transship from canal to uh, rail. And indeed, the first passenger service from Edinburgh and Glasgow uh, brought you by canal from Edinburgh to Causeway End and then by rail to Glasgow. But that didn't last very long because I mean, it was a bit unsatisfactory variety of reasons and when the railway, the main railway was opened, of course, they, uh, that superseded that entirely. Uh, Causeway End now is a small marina for uh, liveaboard boats mostly and other boats. The low road, the narrow, well not the blockage, but the very low passage, now proper size, and the A801 as it is today. After that, after the A801, you go into uh, a long stretch, which could just Pullman and the Reading West Quarter towards um, Falkirk. And um, although there's not a great deal of significant interest in that, it is interesting because it is the portion of the canal that has probably seen the greatest change over time. For example, uh, Pullman and the Reading, there used to be, would be the far distance, the number 23 pit and then Nobel's Explosives Works and a swing bridge just, just there. That's the, the swing bridge that was there. That's all changed radically now. I mean, that is what you see, and in a light industrial estate, which had been there for some time, on the towpath side, and new housing on the other side, the off side, and a very derelict swing bridge now. But moving on, we come now to, to Falkirk, to the High Brig, which is one of the more interesting bridges. It's it and its immediate predecessor, because of the height, I mean, it looks slightly different from the standard bridge, although I believe that fundamentally they are the same type of bridge. This one is of particular interest because of the, the Lafton and Greeton faces on it. Um, it's bridge 61, it gives the date and does the Laffin face and on the other side, the Greeton face, which there are many uh, stories about why they were there. But um, anyway, they may or may not be true. What they lead to is the tunnel that had to be constructed to avoid Calendar House. That's the entrance to the tunnel. That's uh, inside the tunnel. It's now, now as light, didn't originally. And that's the west end of the tunnel, looking back into it. Just beyond the tunnel, I mentioned earlier the Seagull Trust, and that is their Falkirk headquarters. Um, they're also at Rathaun Kirkintilloch. And then 
we come to the canal former, we've, we passed the, the locks, the head of the old locks is, is back here a bit. That was an extension which was cut soon after opening to make the descent for those who are changing boats at Falkirk easier and quicker, shorter. Um, and that was for many years, the end of the canal, but with, with the uh, Millennium Link, we had an extension cut from about a mile to the site of the Falkirk wheel. And this is where the extension takes off. And just after it takes off, it goes over this green bank aqueduct, which is new. And then it goes in that direction till you come to the staircase, head of the two new staircase locks, uh, which mark the, the well, towards the end of the, the beginning of the junction with the Forth and Clyde. Because you come out of the locks, staircase lock, as you will know, is one where the bottom gate of the first lock is the top gate of the second, rather than having a batch of water in between. Uh, and then you go sharp right and go underneath the Antonine Wall and the railway in the Rough Castle Tunnel. Um, that's, yeah, that's seen the Man Street boat, emer game bird emerging from the Rough Castle Tunnel. Uh, and that's one of the um, Scottish Canal's trip boats uh, heading for the case on, on the wheel. And there it is. Well, isn't it? There's something there. And it revolves. There is a boat up there. And you get a good view of the visitor centre and of the countryside beyond. You come out of the, the caisson of the, uh, the Falkirk wheel, and if you're going into the Forth and Clyde, you go through the Jubilee Lock, which is the new lock, which is the, uh, still on the Union Canal. But once you come out of that, there you are in the Forth and Clyde Canal, and that is the view of the, the wheel from the Forth and Clyde. And we should really stop there, but um, I won't go on because there's the Kelpies sort of uh, simultaneous attraction uh, with the um, with the wheel, and it, and there's there's our boat, St Magdalene at the Kelpies, but that finishes all I have to say. <laughs>